thank you all for coming uh, to our first uh, event of our Codex uh, Speaker Series. Um, so my name is Roland Vogel. I am Executive Director of Codex. Uh, Codex is a joint center between Stanford Law School and the Computer Science Department that uh, uses or focuses on research and development of information technologies uh, that uh, make the legal system more efficient. So uh, it's my great uh, honor to introduce uh, one of the uh, leading uh, legal technology scholars uh, in the country to you as our first uh, speaker. Uh, uh, Dan Katz is uh, assistant professor at uh, Michigan State University College of Law. Uh, he's a prolific author. Uh, his work uh, has been covered uh, by all the major news outlets, uh, uh, New York Times, Wired, uh, Slate Magazine, uh, you name it. Uh, his, uh, his work has been uh, covered. Um, his uh, work focuses on uh, quantitative um, modeling of uh, litigation and uh, jurisprudence uh, and sort of the general impact of information technology on the legal services market. Uh, he uh, holds a, a PhD in um, uh, political science and public policy as well as a JD uh, and an MPP from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, and he also, uh, before actually joining the faculty on uh, Michigan State, uh, 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 Michigan State University College of Law, he uh, was a um, fellow in empirical studies uh, at the University of, University of Michigan Law School and an uh, Eigert Fellow uh, at, um, uh, at the University of Michigan Center for the Study of Complex Systems. So uh, in his talk today, um, Professor Katz will, will uh, talk about quantitative legal prediction and uh, why he uh, learned to stop worrying and start preparing for the um, data-driven uh, future of the legal services industry. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that uh, kind uh, uh, introduction, and uh, it's um, you know it's great my great honor and privilege you know to be in front of you here today to talk about quantitative legal prediction. Um, I uh, uh, I'd like to I'd like to sort of start um, briefly by just a asking you um, uh, to think about all of the things that you do in every every day where you make a prediction. How many times have you already made a prediction or an assessment, even in an autopilot version of an assessment about what was going to happen in some area just today? Now think about every day how many times a lawyer is called upon to make an assessment or a prediction. That's what I want you to think about as we go through this. And I just would ask you to reserve judgment about all of this. Don't put up that wall that this isn't possible, okay? Because that's what I have to deal with sometimes, but you're not going to do that. This is Stanford. You're above that. Okay. So, uh, so today what I'd like to do is sketch a little bit uh, 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 where I think the industry is heading. When I say the industry, I, say, I mean the legal services industry slash legal product industry. So uh, legal information products being part of a broader umbrella of, of legal services or of, of, uh, of law. Um, so I believe that we are moving into an era of data-driven law practice, and the analogy is data-driven medicine. So um, I want to tell you some areas where this is going on. And I think there's great news in here. It, there's good news. I'm not worried. I'm excited. There's all these possibilities. And you should be excited as well. I just want you to help get prepared. I want to help prepare, flag you to the things that you should be doing to prepare for the future. But there's lots of possibilities. So before talking about the law business, legal services industry, I just want to talk a little bit about some broader trends that are going on, because I think they bear on what's happening in law. So here are some broad trends. So this is a buzzword that's used a lot, big data. And what's driving that? Increasing computing power, that's the Moore's Law part of it. Decreasing data storage costs, that's Crider's Law. Those together are fundamentally opening up the possibility frontier for science and also for technical possibility. This point was made in Nature, 2008, science, economist, it's old hat now, science, and then of course, you know, and some of you heard this yesterday. Of course, McKinsey's about three years late to the game, but, you know, better late than never. Uh, so, um, so 
I just want to talk about, when we talk about big data, if you're not familiar with it already, how big is big? I just want to give you a little conception uh, uh, of, of, of what's possible and where we are right now. So uh, petabyte or petabyte is a lot of data. I like this, this, this phrase or what have you, this, this infographic. Um, so there's a, in a one gig, a uh, little flash drive or what have you, um, about, you took 1,024 of those, you have a terabyte which you can buy at the retail level right now, take another 1,024 of those, you have a, a petabyte. Now, um, this, is, this is the Crider's Law piece of this. This is the decreasing cost of data storage. So in 1998, a, 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 a one gig uh, of storage cost $228. In 2007, it's 88 cents. And just to zoom out a little bit, if you looked at the price in 1981, it's $300,000. And today, uh, or last year, it's 10 cents. That's this massive decay that's gone on and the cost of data storage. There's corresponding increase. Moore's law is the one that people typically know better, which is the processor speed is moving in the other direction. So just to show you what that means, uh, this is a little bit dated, but it just gives you the idea. Uh, when there were 100 billion photos on Facebook, that's about 15 uh, of those. This is my favorite, though. It's the one down here. The entire written works of mankind from uh, beginning uh, of recorded history in every language is 50 out of ice. So, colossal storage, of course, well known in the storage space, uh, uh, um, uh, has predicted uh, two to five years, I'd put it closer to the five year number, $750 for a petabyte. So, back of the napkin, $37,500. In principle, you could store the entire written works of humanity <laughs> in every language. That's what we mean when we talk, when we talk about big data. Okay, but data is only half the story. Okay, so having a lot of data is a lovely thing, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. This is the other piece, computation and AI, and what's going on on that half of the ledger sheet. So the AI revolution is very much on, a point that was made in this uh, Wired Magazine article uh, now from a couple of years ago. Another example would be something like this, IBM Watson. So the Watson group is actively working on healthcare right now, Makes sense. That's a trillion dollar industry. Talked to one of them. They said, well, legal, we looked at legal. Legal's only billions. <laughs> I.e., we'll get to it later. <laughs> Take care of healthcare first. But um, uh, so look, the AI revolution is on, but it's not what we thought. And, th and I think that's, you know, that's the point the Wired Magazine article makes and most people uh, understand, which is we're in the age of soft artificial intelligence. This isn't robots having empathy. This is something different. This is the softer or weaker version of AI. But in terms of what's possible, a lot of things are possible from that, and that's what's important. You know, and so somebody like uh, Mark Andreessen has made this point in the Wall Street Journal. Again, he's focused on something like healthcare and education, but makes this point. Companies in every industry should assume that a software revolution is coming. You guys can help storm the Bastille, right? That's the good news. That's the bad news, too, if you're in the Bastille. You want to be storming, not being stormed. That's the, the idea, right? Okay. It's hard, not hard to sell. We're in the valley, right? You know that. So first thing I hear typically is, you can't replace what I do with a computer. Okay? I think, it, I think that the area that bears most resemblance to law is finance and trading. We have a call. That's fine. Uh, uh, I, I think it's useful to point to industries like finance where human reasoning used to reign supreme. Judgment was being executed by mental models or a light version of data, and now that's no longer the case. So finance was an industry where human re reasoning reigned supreme, but not anymore. So the quants took over the space, for better or for worse. We can have a conversation about the policy piece that's associated with that. I'd be happy to have that. I don't, but I'm doing the is, not the ought today, okay? This is the is conversation, okay? So. 50% of the trades or more on a given day. It's actually up from that. This is like the weaker version. That's fine. I think that's the Boston Shuttler right there, uh, if you know those of you who do finance. 50% um, of the trades on the New York Stock Exchange are being done by algorithms, not by humans. It was an industry that was run by human judgment and was sliding across the spectrum. Now, humans are involved all, in, all the time. Finance still exists. People still have jobs in finance. And I think it's not the end of, it's the skills you need change. 
That's okay. That's the good news, right? You can get in front of this. So, you know, you can watch this little 60 minutes about, about speed trading or algo trading or prop trading or whatever you want to call it. Um, so how about this one? The DARPA challenge, 2004. Try it. Here's the goal. Build a driverless car that could go 150 miles. 2004. Winning car makes it eight miles and gets hung up on a rock. Of course, we know the, we know, we know the end of that story. We know where that goes. Maybe you guys have uh, uh, seen it floating around here. So you go forward into 2012, 2011. We, Google has a car that's gone 300,000 miles. One accident, to my knowledge, and I believe they were run into by another party, but they didn't you know, cause the accident or what have you. Um, so uh, uh, I didn't put this in here for want of time, but if you take a look at the book, uh, Race Against the Machine, this is what they talk about. As you go into, if you know the Ray Kurzweil example of the chessboard problem, as you go into the second half of the chessboard, and we continue to double a number, double processor speed and half data costs. Po things that seemed impossible and fanciful become quite possible. We have a driverless car. We have to work out all of the legal questions that are raised by that, absolutely. But as a technical matter, we're there. Now let's talk about law. So now that we've seen driverless cars, and we've seen algorithmic trading, and I do think finance bears a lot of relationship to the types of things that go on uh, in law. Of course, I want to say, you don't want to care, I don't want to characterize the whole industry. There's a lot of sub-industries within law. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so it's not a binary proposition. Displacing 20 or 30 percent of the workload is a pretty damn significant thing. And so I want to just pose a, in the paper that I'll be making available online, pretty soon some of you have it because I, I made it available to the class I spoke to, but it's littered with typos. Uh, um, but, you know, the ideas are there. Be better to have the ideas and not, and the type, rather, you know, you can have a beautiful manuscript with no information. I'd rather have the typos. Okay, so uh, this is just a hypothetical idea of where I think we are right now. 100 lawyers. You've got 70 of those lawyers that are safe, 30 that are, in, in, that are doing tasks that are potentially subjectable to automation. It's not like you can just, let's say you don't just get rid of the 30. What happens is, is there are new opportunities created for folks that are law plus tech and tech plus law. So tech plus law is a person who's really a technologist who knows some law. And then a law plus tech is somebody who's, a, you know, has core legal training but has a bunch of other technical skills, design, knows unique delivery models, right? I think the four pillars of this are law, tech, design, and delivery. Substantive law, got lots of that. Technology, design, delivery model. We got, we got an access to justice problem in this country that is an abomination. Civil Gideon's not coming. We need a, we need a retail model to actually solve these problems. That, that's you know, partly, a con partly uh, uh, in my view, a controversial idea that, that we have this problem. We don't have a solution. I don't think legal aid's up to it. Our family works in that, in that space. That they got way more to, to do than, that, than they can possibly solve. Retail is the way out. So anyway, I think this is a hypothetical idea, but I think it sort of bears on what's possible. But hey, this is, this is, the, this is the job growth area right there. I wouldn't want to compete for the 70. I'd like to compete for these. How many resumes are there that have that, those sets of skills? So anyway, that's for the students here. This is your time. Law plus tech, design and delivery. Okay, so these are terms that I think will help drive the future of the industry. If you think of lawyers as being like analysts, right, who have substantive knowledge plus quantitative training, then, you're, then you start pushing in, and what it means to be a lawyer is words like this. I remember, you know, other than Ron's class and a couple classes I teach, I don't remember in law school like us talking about this at, at any point. Like in torts, I don't remember, yeah, we gotta think about feature selection here. You know, we got we to think about like what classification method we're going to use. That's okay. It's an exciting time. Like I said, things are changing. Clustering, NLP, what have you. All right? So this, my friend Drew Conway has this Venn diagram, which I really mm -hmm. like. Substantive expertise, math and statistical knowledge, hacking skills, computing. All right? Got a lot of this. You want, if you make incursions up into the other two parts of the Venn, there's a tremendous payoff. There's massive diminishing marginal returns to that next law class that you take, right? The next substantive law class. The seventh code-based class that you take is probably not going to get you that much further than the sixth, right? 
one of these classes does a lot for you because it opens up a whole, a whole range of possibilities. So again, I, I, my comments are, you know, for all of you here that are, are uh, in school, this is, uh, 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 this is my perspective and, you know, you can reject it or accept it. So what's the next big thing? Quantitative legal prediction. And I want to point to, to various companies, some of whom are in this room, who are doing it already. So I just point you a few articles to take a look at my background. And then this paper I'll put up pretty soon. Okay. There's two things I want to say about prediction. This is the conversation, part of the conversation we have to have, right? As much as I'm an advocate for this, I want to talk about the limits. And the limits are real. Now, when we think about the limits of predictability, I want it to be clear. Humans have limits. Humans are not always good predictors. So the question isn't against some archetype of perfection. It's about what is a human reasoner capable of and what can we do, right? That's the what can we do through a, a, a prediction-based approach. That's the benchmark. It's not against perfection. <laughs> but I want to talk about two things. They're about to have the Empirical Legal Studies Conference here tomorrow, and I'll, I'll be participating in that. But I want to talk about there's a big conceptual distinction between what they're doing and what I'm talking about. You will be hard pressed to find a single prediction paper in the entire conference. Okay? They're not trying to say, they don't try to predict out a sample, or they don't try to forward predict. It's backward looking. There's nothing wrong with that, as I, you know, you'll see when I put the paper up. For, the right, for a well posed problem, that's exactly what you ought to do. For, a, for, for this type of thing, for actually predicting outcomes, it's a different animal. I'll point you to one paper, though, that, uh, that's just published in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies that's taking on this sort of approach. Okay, so hypothesis testing is the core of mainstream science, and I'm all for it, and that's part of my training as well. It's a deductive approach. It's about falsification of a hypothesis. Perfectly valid approach for the right type of question. Most of these advances that we see in this space, of quantitative legal prediction, are going to be inductive. Why do I say that? Because that is what we observe in these other areas that have gone and tried to do this. Fine, algorithmic trading is not a deductive exercise. It is an inductive exercise. And uh, you know, those of you who work in it can back me on that. Um, so in physics, this would be called an inverse problem. <coughs> Forward problem, inverse problem. Deductive, inductive, you know. There's just, I'm just, there are different labels to say the same thing, and I just want to flag that for wherever you're coming from. I don't quite know who the audience fully is here. So um, this is an inductive age. Let me point you to some examples of some problems that have been solved using induction. What do I mean by that? Lot, some of the methods are really black box. They're just trying to mimic what humans would do, even though we're not using the precise process humans do. This is also from science. This is Kepler versus Newton. Kepler, plant it here, plant it there. Don't have, I don't have Newton's laws. I just can say, I can predict I had a planet here, and I know the planet's going to be there. That's a much weaker thing than trying to do Newton, but it's a useful thing you know, to the extent that that's something you want to explore. So that's AI, by the way. That's AI, soft AI. Rules-based approaches for spell checking weren't as successful as a billion clicks. I like to say this is the age of aspirational spelling, which is good news for me. I'm a lousy speller. You probably find a typo in here. I mean, if you've seen the paper, those of you saw the paper, I should have just you know taken my own medicine here or taken my own my own advice. But it's aspirational spelling. Spelling is 1.0 thinking. That's what I tell my students. Right? If you can aspire to spell, it's as though you can spell. Thanks to Google. Google will take you home. I'm just saying, you still have to be able to aspire. You can't write something that has no, bears no resemblance. But it turns out the crowd will help. They're going to funnel the crowd and help direct you in the right, to the right space. So uh, don't waste your time learning to spell. That's what you should tell your children. <laughs> tell them to aspire to spell, and they'll be good to go. Uh, so other, uh, you know, people who bought this also bought that. Collaborative filtering. This is a graph, graph and text-based approach. So you mix the network together with features like you know, language on, uh, you know, wall interactions, text on the page, what have you. I mean, there's different ways you could hook it up. But the idea is, I'm trying to recommend a friend to you based on what I've observed up to time t. I want to recommend a book to you based on what the, my purchases I've observed of you up to time t, what have you. Pandora. Pandora is a great example of 
pure induction to start, then pump the click data in, right? So the Music Genome Project is just create this vector of characteristics about songs, 400 items, right? And then what you want to say is uh, um, try to find some similarity map between songs, and then, you know, it's only going to be first order. It's going to be like kind of a rough cut. But then I observe all the people clicking, essentially choosing songs, not choosing songs, and I can do refinement. And over time, it gets better and better. But you have to, po you have to pose a plausible first order model to get the click data. You have to pose something that actually is like at least plausible. And that's what music, that was the move from Music Genome to Pandora and beyond, okay? So, so that's what I just said. Induce, induce a plausible model from existing data, then validate. Now, this is the most, this is really important, right? Some people will claim induction is like non-scientific. Okay. They're kind of trying to do that with Nate Silver right now. You can check out my blog, computationallegalstudies.com. Computationallegalstudies.com, you can see my response to all of that. Say, so, well, Nate Silver, Nate Silver's not doing science. I, I couldn't disagree more, but that's fine. You can call it engineering if you want. Validation is still really important. He's, he has the problem, right, is that he has one event. I talked about this yesterday in the class. I'll happy to talk more about, it, about, uh, um, about the issues associated. Here are the two ways to do validation. Out of sample or forward predict or both. Best to do both. Out of sample is something like Netflix price. Cut the data set in half, build a model, take it and see who can do best on the other half of the data set. That's a form of validation. At forward predict would be, okay, now we're going to deploy this recommend it, recommendation system for movies to the public and see how it does. Is it going to outperform what we've done up to now? So that, anyway. That's you know the heart of, a, of the inductive approach or machine learning. One other thing I want to say is system dynamics is something you know you have to think about. This is the complex systems part of the talk. So I want you to think about two different complex systems. They're both complex. Weather, where we try to predict. Tides, where we also try to predict. Both have complex dynamics. There's, there's complex and then there's complex. Just to like, you know, just to do hand waving and pass a ton of science that supports all this, right? So, tides are easy and predictable, and we can publish a book of tide tables. You can set your watch. High tide's going to be like now. Then we have this. For weather forecasting outside, or in most instances, outside of 10 days, that's as good as we can do. Almanac. Because the problem is fundamentally difficult. We're in the weather business in law. But here's agriculture production. Almanac. It was a damn useful thing in human history to have an almanac. A damn useful thing. But no one walks around an almanac and says, it's going to rain at 4.30. It's just not that level of prediction, because the problem has dynamics that don't allow for that level of precision. And it's OK. By the way, that's the problem the human reasoner has, too. So it's, it's humans, again, it's not against the benchmark architect. We're in that, we're in that space. It's, I, we're right now trying to build almanacs in this space. And it's just useful to know that the problem actually has properties that don't allow us to do better. So you know, there's a technical treatment this in science. Uh, uh, I love this best from Johnny paper. You should check this out, predicting the behavior of, of uh, technical social, social systems. Um, OK, so my thesis is this. My thesis is that. Uh, Human prediction is the hallmark of the legal services industry. When you go see your lawyer and say, do I have a case, that's a prediction. The race for the future of this industry is trying to use data to develop processes that mimic the behavior that expert reasoners would undertake. Mimic is the key, one of the key words here. Mimic. John's saying, I have a model of how your brain processes information. That's that would be more on the deductive side. The induction is, I can match what that person will say based on some outcome. You know, that's, that's saying I can mimic. That's not saying I'm, I'm paralleling the same internal, internal processes. The key is to do it at scale. So here's, here's the real important idea you should keep in your mind. Humans, of course, are amazing pattern detectors, although they have well-studied well cognitive biases. I mean, there's a whole, obviously, you know, a psychological slash behavioral economics literature about the types of uh, problems we have. We see patterns that aren't there. That's a classic and well, well known bias. We're really good actually at detecting patterns. That's why InfoViz is such a useful thing. We talked about this uh, uh, in the class yesterday is that it's a useful thing because our visual cortex is an amazing pattern detector. 
but we do have this tendency to see patterns in our fish. Aggregation, though, is something we have a problem with. We don't do good with this. Let me put it to you this way. A human reasoner, how many data points can they evaluate? 10,000, 100,000, a million? They don't do that. They use heuristics. And that's where the machines really have a point of incursion because they, they can go and, and actually process a million data points, and you can't. And you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna reduce the problem to some, something you can actually work on. So, quantitative legal prediction, it's already begun. It's just gonna move up the value chain. So here's where we are right now. E-discovery. This is probably the one area of law where there's been the greatest incursion by technology, really because it was impossible to read 60 million emails. So once that became the case, and I don't think, it, uh, uh, I don't think any general counsel is interested in paying the bill for manual review of 60 million emails. So that just made it so that there was like a, a manifest necessity for change in the way things were being done. Of course, you know, this is uh, well known. This Times article is pretty good. These were law jobs that became IBM, EMC, semantic jobs. One of my favorite papers, recent papers, is a paper by Mitsu Galati called Why Don't Law Firms Have R&D Departments? <laughs> You can take a look at it. They shouldn't have allowed this to happen on their watch. They shouldn't have let IBM and EMC take this business the way they had the clients. They should have maintained that. That wasn't mainstream. You discover it was not a mainstream thing. It's mainstream now. It dominates the industry. You go to the, these are, this is the UK one. These two are the two biggest technology conferences in law. This one gets like 10,000 lawyers to go to this a year. It's an e-discovery conference, basically. Virtually every vendor there, 80% or more are selling you discovery, some piece of that puzzle. Some are doing some workflow platter, pl platforms and stuff like that, but it's mostly you discovery. It went from nothing to like just to dominating the whole space. Because the value proposition, when somebody pitches it to you, makes so much sense. Pitches it to a general counsel, then they force the law firm to use it. So that's all about to get reset. Even the thing that has the most technological incursion, if you're not aware, is about to be reset by another form of predictive technology, and that is predictive coding, which for those of you with some background in machine learning, that is a supervised method. That's a supervised method. So you can imagine, where do we go after that? We move along the spectrum from supervised to semi-supervised to unsupervised methods. That's the, you know, uh, um, so there's Judge Peck from the Southern District, who's the judge in the De, uh, De Silva Moore case. This is the uh, recommend patent for predictive coding. Um, you can see my comments about that uh, online. Uh, about it, it, to say it's questionable is to say the least. I believe there's an article out there that says more PR than IP. But you know that's uh, that's going on the editorial board, I suppose, right there uh, out to the world. That's wonderful. Um, uh, so okay, here's another place: legal procurement and legal supply chain management being driven by prediction. This is a really nice uh, bunch of work out of, out of the business school at Oxford. General counsel seeing. Uh, legal services production line, automation, production, those are jobs right now. Legal process outsourcing, legal automation, lots of opportunities in this space. Here's one company that I'll highlight. This is not the only company that's doing this. I just think that they're the furthest along. They convinced general counsels to pool their data together, and they have $15 billion in legal spend looking for patterns of, of how bills or how those bills are being paid and where there's some value propositions. Looking for not just overbilling, but instances where their their other competitors are paying less but for a similar service. Law firms hate this, hate this, hate this, hate this. <laughs> you can get the app right now, you want to download it. This is the free version, right? They have fancier stuff, but you know, here's your left. Uh, uh, here's your left-hand side variable and your right-hand side variables just on the phone, right? And you know you can play around with it. It's called the Rate Driver app. Take a look at that. Um, so yeah, there's an app for that. Turns out. So this is 10 years ago, and I'm going to just move through this so we can do some questions. Um, there was this tournament done. Many of you probably have some familiarity with this between law professors and uh, other experts predicting Supreme Court decisions. So this is a prediction paper. This is an actual prediction paper. <laughs> what do they do? They said, you got to put in your votes in advance, for, or your, 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 your tally in advance, and the machine's going to predict. 
and they're just using a classification tree. They start with, I believe, about 25 parameters. They, they get it down to six, and then those are the ones that are actually being used here in the tree. So um, the machine won in that context. And I just point you to that example. Now, that's 10 years ago now. It's a great example of what's possible, but what does the market really care about? Disputes. <coughs> Disputes. I think it's a very strange thing we do in law. We read a lot of cases, which are such rare events, and what we're trying to do is induce from that what's going to happen back at case at, at dispute level. There are 4.4 million cases in Amer written decisions in American law. How many have you read? How many disputes do you think there are? Have there been? And you were trying to build a model for dispute because that's usually what you're working on. I'm just challenging, I'm challenging the fundamental orthodoxy by saying that, but it's okay. So we're bargaining in the shadow of the law and we're trying to figure out what will happen at some end state and we're trying to come back to this, to this current state. So what's the first question is, do I have a case? <coughs> or if you're on the other side, what, what are we looking at here? What's our exposure looking like, right? How is that assessment generated? And that's what I asked you to start with at the beginning. How are you generating that assessment? Well, let me just reduce form, explain to you what you've done, those students who are here. Um, you're doing induction, basically. You're being hit with a bunch of data points. That'd be the cases you're being asked to read. Somebody is guiding you through those, and we're trying to induce the model. So uh, cleverness is one thing that we're interested in. Your ability to reason by analogy, to be clever, to, to think what's a plausible analogy from what's not a plausible analogy, being able to predict better than others. You're inducing the rules. So I show you enough to the point where you can induce the rules, and then I give you a new example, and you try to take your mo inductive model and lay it onto a new and predict. Sound familiar? How do you arrive at that conclusion? That's what we're. That's the heart of what research and development inside of a law school could look like. These are the things you got to face. Analogy is a killer. That makes it such a non-trivial problem. Analogy is such a, an amazing idea and such a difficult thing to implement. And I just want to be completely clear about that. That's super hard. You're. I mean, it is stunning what people can do by an analogy, particularly lawyers have been trained to do. It's stunning. You think about, how could we have de determined that somebody was able to do that? Now, we tend to treat that as art. The question is, is any of that science? When somebody says something to you and you're persuaded by it, what have they tapped into? They're tapped into something. They could say something else and you'd say, what are you talking about? Then you hear this one and you're saying, oh man, that is, I'm just captivated by that. What is it they've touched in? What is being triggered in you that allows you to say, yeah, that actually, I get that. That makes sense. Well, that's really persuasive. Pattern detection. High dimensional similarity mapping, analogical reasoning. That's the core of what we're you know, doing in, in law. So this is, the, this, is the, this is the setup. This is what I think we're going to head to, and we already have with some of the companies that exist in this space. Similar is the key word. That's where all the lifting's doing, being done. What, when I give you a new scenario, what do you download and bring to print to the present to say that's a like case or a similar case? And that's where analogy makes this such a slippery idea. It's not, if it was trivial, it would have already been done. Okay. So, an example. The company came right out of here. That's Machina. They're doing this in the IP space, which I think makes a lot of sense. Is don't try to take on the whole problem. Work on a thing that you can execute on with a reasonably well-established domain and build out from there. Try to, try to do this in terms of like silos. So I like to say like we're in the micro-brew stage and we're going to maybe somebody's going to create Anheuser-Busch. But we're right now just, you know, making delicious micro-brews. So, uh, so uh, okay. Here's a paper in gels. It is a dramatic departure from virtually any paper you'll see. In, in, the, in the law space. Well, it's because of this word, and they aren't just saying it, they're actually doing it. Predicting. So this is securities fraud litigation. They built a model that is a predictive model. It predicts both the likelihood of settlement and the expected settlement amount. And why it's different is, one, it only uses variables known at the date of filing, and two, it flags high exposure cases. These are the ones that are simultaneously fairly unlikely to settle, but if they do, they're going to settle for a large amount. And I will note about that, 
they test out a sample. We talked about it earlier. They test out a sample. So they actually show, they actually validate their model. And that's why it's a huge departure from virtually any paper you'll see. It's a really, it's a, it's a really good paper, and I suggest you check it out. Okay, look, I have a lot of other examples I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. Okay, I have a lot more examples of companies I can point you to that are doing this stuff. It's getting going. So, there, there, there are big research and development questions in our industry. Um, uh, my research group is actively working on a bunch of these different things. I'll point you to a few. I have a law lab at Michigan State called reInvent Law, reInventLaw.com. Um, here's a few things we're doing at the lab. You can check out this 3D HD video of the first 35 years of the United States Supreme Court Citation Network. You can you know, see the big bang in constitutional law, which is the, are the prize cases. Um, and a bunch of other stuff that we're doing. Um, Legal Language Explorer, which is a free, uh, basically, n-grams. We have 450,000 cases that are being indexed there, and more to come by the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, you can check out my blog, computationallegalstudies.com. And uh, I just want to say, look, there are, these are technical questions. It's also very practical. Lawyers are in the prediction business, at least in part. The technology has already disrupted law. That's the world, part of the world we're living in. But there's going to be a lot more. This is not just a recession. In other words, welcome to Law's Information Revolution. It's going to be map on the exam. I'll open it up for questions. Uh, yes, please. Dan, this is an unfair question. Oh, okay. Unfair question. I'll refuse to answer you. it then if it's unfair. Um, there are probably 100,000 recent law school graduates, in, or maybe less, but right, 50,000 then, who went, to law, who went to law school because they were an English major, they took one math class mm -hmm. in college, they didn't go to Stanford, right? I'm not worried right. about the people here. That's true. Um, and they're $100,000 they're they're $100, in debt. Yes. And this is a this is Paul Campos question, right? Yes. Like like what I mean look, I'm with you, I'm learning R, I'm trying to learn machine learning, all this stuff, but like there I'm, I'm what advice do 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 you have for those folks? And like I said, I, it, it's not your job to figure all that out. I think you're doing a lot to try to help people in that situation, but what's what's I didn't create the problem, but I am trying to develop the solution, a okay. plausible solution. I've written a paper called The MIT School of Law, which is yep. my perspective on yep. what ought to happen in this case, which is a polytechnic research. Law school could be a polytechnic operation. That's a response. To yep. the, I, the things that Paul Campos raises, I don't disagree with in so much as we have a very serious problem. It may, the, the water may have not made it here to Stanford, but it's made it a lot of other places. The question is what to do about it. Mm -hmm. If this is where the industry's uh -huh. heading, then the right types of training people are gonna need to be successful is gonna have to change. So um, if you go on to reinventlaw.com, you'll see all the classes that we're rolling out that are responsive to this. I teach electronic discovery. There are jobs in electronic discovery. Good jobs that pay like deep, really serious, like reasonable money. That's that we're doing, I'm doing everything I can to try to solve this problem. Yeah, and I don't, I'm I don't. one person, but, but the, this, if you agree with any part of this thesis, it's about to get worse, not better. You know, there's still this delusion that this is just a recession. I think at this point, the conventional wisdom, you know, folks like Bill Henderson or what have you, is this is a little more than that. This is a little bit more than that. And mo one of the biggest problems is that law firm, law general counsels do not want to pay first and second year associates to work on their matters. So it's hard to get a break in the industry now. Again, water may not have reached it to Stanford, but it's it's definitely, you know, maybe maybe a couple bits and toes or something. Um, it's, thank you for that. That's a it's a fair point. Is that it? We're all in agreement? Oh, yes? Microphone for him? You can come up here. Actually, there's a mic right here. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, you are just focusing on, from an attorney point of view, would you be able to automate the judgment process? so that trivial judgments like uh, small claims, um, and anyone uh, who has, let's say, $500 of uh, problem, I can just file some problems on uh, my internet, and my website can decide the outcome. 
So a lot of trivial problems, like you know, uh, the coffee shop, he overcharged me $2. And he's, they are doing it for the last two months every day. So in that case, a lot of problems, uh, when we do disputes from a dispute, uh, what you say from a bottom side, from top side, if there is a computer program, uh, I guess that's a, your predict predictive model, uh, that will definitely help me as a uh, general user mm -hmm. uh, to find out uh, if there is an existing law that can support me or my theories. Okay, uh, well one thing I would say is, uh, if you, if you broaden the idea of laws being disputes between individuals where there's some sort of, take eBay. I mean, they're solving both, virtually every dispute without the use of a lawyer. I think it was like, I might be wrong, it's 50 million disputes they've settled without a lawyer. Now, the question is, is how to generalize the approach that's being done there to this dispute that you described. I don't, I don't, have, I don't pretend to have an answer. Uh, um, I do have a startup that works in, in the criminal law space that's thinking about the very, not even criminal law, like on the civil criminal end of the spectrum where lots of court resources are being allocated to things where really the judges are not even really making decisions. It's, it's almost pro forma. Freeing up the court to focus on other matters seems like something that would be a useful thing. Uh, um, but I, I don't know, your coffee shop example, I, I don't have a solution. For yeah, that I mean, directly. Let me give you a business use case. The okay. business use case is that I have necessary information and understanding of common law. Okay. But when I go to court, court clerk rejects my documents because it's not in proper format. Um, so let's say if I have to file motion against a small claim, and my application gets rejected because it was missing some tiny, tiny parts. Mm -hmm. So if I have a website where I can generate a basic template ah. that can just tell me, you know, look, okay, so there is a, uh, let me give you another website. There is a website for uh, journalists where they can generate letters to get uh, uh, information in Freedom Act, uh, Act. Okay. And it's an automatic process. That's right. So if, I, if you have a website, if you can design a website where I can generate a template, uh, okay, here are my problems, just generate me a, uh, let's say, how to file a motion letter or whatever you call it. Uh, in that case, uh, I can just go to the judge and I can say, here is the letter, and accept me as an attorney, you know? Uh, I will say that there is document assembly companies out there that are trying to do some of what you're saying. Another company I point you to is coming, I think it's called Smokeball, and what they've done is taken, this is a small thing that eats up a lot of time, getting the forms from the local courts all around the country. I have to fill out some motion or some filing that you're talking about. Being able to build a form out uh, those forms and so that it just it reduces down into a database or a template that you can just type stuff in. That's what this company is basically trying to do. Not because it's the biggest thing, on, but it's this thing that eats up a lot of little bits of time. And in the aggregate, at least this is the theory. Their business, their value proposition is like we're, we can take that away from you for some, you know, serve it monthly service fee or something like this. So you could just, real quickly, we'll go and collect all the forms from all these districts, not just federal, but like all these state courts, and they have different, you know, you can take a look at this, this company called uh, Smokeball, I believe is the name of it. Very good. Oh, yes, hi. Um, I guess I had a question about whether or not there were consistent differences. You said the um, accuracy of the AI models were generally better than the human predictions. Were there consistent differences in the types of errors that were being made? In which, which example? Uh, you had one there was, uh, I believe, 75% accuracy by the AI model and 59% accuracy in uh, human predictions. It was uh, uh, under... Yeah. Thank you. Okay, oh, so are there... Yeah, sorry. Any, any consistent differences in... Are we able to source what types of errors are being made? Because I think that might change the extent right. to which people trust the model That's predictions. Right. They're bad on that um, the humans did better, this is my memory, of, they did better in instances where there uh, was low information. So it was an event that hadn't occurred with enough frequency. But Josh Blackman's here and he runs Fantasy SCOTUS, so this is actually the guy you should direct the question to. Um, I just read Supreme Court fantasy, which is somewhat similar to advanced entry. The reason why the entry there was only limited knowledge, and experts on constitutional myths and common law questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, just to do a side note, uh, I run a Supreme Court fantasy list for crowdsource market. Our model based between the algorithm and the expert, we're about 70% accuracy. We have about 10,000 people make predictions for the Supreme Court, and if you have enough wide people, you crowdsource about 70, 73% accuracy at the end of the year. And they answer probably about 75% of the cases, a very wide swath. Maybe specific question, sorry. 
No, 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 it's, it's fine. I mean, uh, uh, in what, what Josh does is, is the other approach is just crowdsource prediction. And um, the thing with the Supreme Court is it's just, there's, the N is so small that it's, it's, it's a bit difficult to think that you're going to, I mean, there's going to be some limit on performance when the interaction of topic and justice and, you know, other factors is a, is a cluster that's highly, that's fairly rare. You see, but like, if you think about all these other disputes where we ha have 8,000 uh, uh, observations or 10,000, I mean, that paper is not really a big data paper. It's actually a small data paper, right? It's really small data. It's like, I don't know what they took, you know, 75 cases or something like this. Uh, uh, Ron? What would you like to see happen in legal education? Can you give a few more examples of the types of classes that you would like to see or what kind of training? Um, I think, I think um, uh, so you take a school like Stanford. If we think it's law, if you agree with my framework, law, tech, design, and delivery, you need an intro class in technology. You need some notions of design. Design, I mean by that, is thinking about problems. People need to think about problems like engineers do a little bit more. So if you think about you know, one paradigm, although I don't necessarily love this for this, would be like Lean Six Sigma, the way they think about manufacturing. It's the way you ought to think about moving workflow from one end to the other. Well. Some of that's going to be about you know, designing information architectures that will work on that. And also, design is, if you're going to do like a retail-facing piece of law, what is the marble and wood of the 21st century when you move stuff onto the internet? Right? So like you go into a fancy law firm, they have you know, the marble and the beautiful wood and so forth. What's the analog as we move into something like that? That's a design question. You know, but why does Apple have high margins? Design. Hi, I have a particular question about the uh, prediction in legal industry. You mentioned uh, prediction about ties and prediction about climate. Uh, but the difference here is that our prediction about the tie pattern or the climate is not going to, at least in the short term, affect. Just a little louder. Uh, uh, our prediction about the tide pattern or the climate are not going to affect what's going to happen in the short term. However, our prediction about the result of particular settlements mm -hmm. are going to affect you know, uh, uh, people who are actually negotiating for the settlement. Yes. So in other words, do you think the execution risks of all those predictions are going to make the predictions themselves less worse? worse? I mean, this, the, the, you know, this is something like, you know, there'd be calcification of the law or something like this, because if you actually knew the likelihood, you wouldn't, you'd just stop. You wouldn't, you, people would settle all these disputes. Um, yeah, that's a that's a potential implication that would potentially unwind the model. I mean, this is this has been played out before, like in in economics, like Robert Lucas, the economist, talks about, like you know, if you can predict everything, then you know people will just back and put that in the model. Well, that's what happened in finance too. It's like you have to develop an increasingly sophisticated algorithm to actually develop to get any arbitrage, right? The arbitrage is I got to get the next thing because the thing that's already been done won't get me any. There's no value in it in the sense that everybody can do it. I mean, that's why I think that's the path we're on. The problem is data quality may, uh, may go down. The other issue, of course, that's pretty serious is that a lot of the information is tied up in these silos. So uh, insurance companies have in information, law firms have information, but trying to get comprehensive information. And now I see somebody who has comprehensive information stepping up to the mic. So, uh, 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 so this is what you ought to try to do. But I agree, the calcification point still stands. I mean, that's potentially the road we're on right now. At whether that's a good thing or not, it's probably not a fantastic thing. Uh, in some sense, it's a good thing to the people who get better information. If you think of the general counsel as a le legal risk portfolio manager, then the question is, what can I do to minimize those risks? And probably, you know, maybe I'll lose this dispute, but if I have better intelligence, I'll win over a large vo uh, volume of disputes. So. Yeah, thanks. So the, I'm Josh, the CEO of Lex Machina. So thanks for a great presentation, and thanks for mentioning us. Um, I was curious your opinion because a lot of the changes that you were talking about will ultimately have to be driven by the general counsels. That's right. Right. A lot of you know law firms are not going to change themselves in a lot of these ways unless forced to by the GCs. Now a lot of these GCs mostly came from law firms. Of course, they didn't most very few started out in a corporation and and and, and rose through the ranks. So how do you see that uh, playing out over time? That's why it's going to be slow. That's why it's going to be slow. This is the you know, this is the idea of one thing I talk about in the paper is Loud Cloud is a great example of this. Mark Andreessen came up with a cloud computing company in, I believe, 1999. 
market wasn't ready for it. You know, it was able, ultimately able to sell. But I think that, you know, so you have a great idea that can work, but the question is, do the relevant people actually adopt the technology? Obviously, that's the type of question that, you know, is asked all throughout the valley all the time, and the question still stands in this context. I do think one thing that is, at least, this is anecdote, I'll just acknowledge that, but the people I talk to, the GCs and other folks I talk to, is that's what the crisis did create. Pressure from the, re from the rest of the company to actually reduce the legal spend. That the law division isn't going to be a sacred cow anymore. So once you start saying, well, why, why do we pay this lawyer this much? You know, there's law firms live off of brand and signal independent of, you know, quality assessments. I mean, do I think there's a tremendous amount of difference between a lot of law firms? No, I don't. I think a lot of them are, are, are similar enough. And if it's not about the company case, which most things aren't, maybe I'm prepared to, again, with the goal of reducing the legal spend. Some companies are under more pressure than others, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 tech, the adoption question, it's got to come from GCs. I don't expect law firms. I actually think to some law firms, if they really could, you know, get right, it's like this is a value play. Is to say, look, we're actually on top of all of this. I mean, Safar Shaw tried to do this by using Lean Six Sigma, but you know, most law firms have not seen this as a way to actually market and to, to differentiate themselves. I was wondering if you could expand on what you had mentioned about access to justice, moving away mm -hmm. from the corporate and big law mm -hmm. side. Do you see activity in this space, or what do you predict the... Um, yeah, I do see. I do see activity. I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in is access to justice. I'm interested in retail law. So the developments in the UK, uh, developments, uh, well, we have uh, Raj Avianka right here. Developments on the retail side to try to deliver legal services where people really are at price points they can actually afford to pay. That uh, I see, you know, personally, I see non-lawyer ownership rule as being the impediment to all that. The UK has just dispensed with that. And now you see things like quality solicitors. You see kiosks inside of WH Smith, which is like the equivalent of CVS or Rite Aid or whatever. You see that people are getting justice at where they really are, and they're getting it at a price point that they can actually afford to pay. And I, I, I don't have any deep hopes that civil Gideon's coming anytime soon. This is my own. My only I, but then the only way that that's going to work to get the prices down is you got to figure out how to reduce the amount of human involvement, how to commoditize the work, how to how to use technology to the maximum extent possible to make the prices reasonable. You can't, I mean, to use the Suskin framework, it can't all be bespoke. It's got to be commoditized. It's got to be efficient, and that um, that really requires technology. So one of the things I would I say to students that I know that are interested in access to justice, you need to learn about technology. You need to learn about technology. That's the only way to solve the problem that I can see. Design wouldn't hurt either. Uh, yes, please. Um, Sorry, just a little. Or there's a mic right here. You used the uh, comparison to um, quantitative finance. Yes. and predictions in something like weather. Those worlds are naturally driven by numbers. Uh, law is driven by words. So my question is, I guess, um, about data collection, data aggregation, and uh, making data operational so that a machine can understand and process it. So I was wondering if you have comments about that. Well, I mean, the field of computational linguistics slash natural language processing has a lot to say about taking words and converting them into numbers. And it's non-trivial, I acknowledge that, but uh, uh, a lot has actually been done on that front. So the question is, if I give you, I mean, think of e-discovery. I give you a document and I ask you a straightforward question. Is this relevant or not relevant? Binary proposition. You are gonna do what to make that assessment? You're gonna use language and other metadata that's contained therein, right? And you're gonna make that assessment. So again, the inductive approach in, in, that people will use is to say, okay, I'm gonna, this is the supervised method, I'm gonna observe, uh, uh, I'm gonna seed an algorithm with some number of observations of you tagging things relevant, not relevant, relevant, not relevant, 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 not relevant, right? And then I'm gonna to try to figure out what features you're loading on by looking at what differentiates the documents between the ones you say relevant versus not relevant. I mean, this would be like building a classifier or something like this. 
So that's an example where language, which is a feature of a document, is being used, turned into a number if you prefer, if you want to pour into it. You know, you can think about, you can do some syntactic or semantic processing. Obviously, syntax is easy to understand. Semantics, you can, can execute on it. Now the question is, when you read a document and you decide it's one you want to reference, why? What is it that you're loading on? So when you, that's the question people ought to be asking and then try to figure out how to engineer the solution. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Um. All right. Uh, any more questions? All right. So uh, before we actually uh, uh, let our speaker go, I just wanted to make uh, uh, two quick plugs for two uh, upcoming sp uh, Codex Speaker Series events. So uh, first, uh, tomorrow, uh, Professor Blackman, Josh Blackman, will talk about uh, assisted legal uh, decision-making. And next week on uh, Thursday, uh, we have uh, Mark Lauritsen, who's going to speak about automated uh, legal reasoning. So uh, I hope to see you all there. And yeah, please join me in thanking our, our speaker. For <laughs>